I struggled very hard to identify the birds, some birds, some birds, when I first came as a, as a student in 1963. And so I came back in 1970 with the intent of actually writing a new guide to the birds of Puerto Rico. It just so happens, I came back on vacation, and um, as I was studying the birds here, I kept running into the birds that weren't supposed to be here. And I decided, well, gee, it'd be nice to stay and spend more time to actually learn them before I actually wrote a book about them, because there just was not information in the literature at that time about some of the birds that I was finding. So I spent seven years here from 1970 to 77, and during that time, ultimately, I started as a biologist, and they said, hey, go out and do whatever you need to do, because no one really knew what I should be. No one, they did not, the birds had not been officially studied by the government. When I left the island in 77, I was in charge of fish and wildlife planning. So I was very fortunate in moving up uh, from being a field biologist to actually getting the experience uh, across the board in doing, trying to conserve the birds of Puerto Rico. And so I had the total freedom to do what I thought was important for bird conservation. This is the building where, on the right, the white building is the capital. This building, the far the building in the distance, is the old school of medicine. And that's where that building overlooks the Atlantic Ocean. You couldn't be in a more beautiful place. So I came on vacation, had a job doing for seven years exactly what I've been doing on my vacation. And from where, where we are sitting here right now, those two birds, um, the Indian silverbill and the saffron finch, not only did I find new introduced species to Puerto Rico, I found these two birds that were breeding birds of Puerto Rico on the same day. And the silver bill I found one mile south of here, and the saffron finch I found one mile east of here, in Sagrado Corazon. And that's how different bird watching was in those times, because in those seven years I think I ran into two bird watchers in the entire time that I was out in the field. So I was the only professional person working on birds for the Department of Natural Resources. There was another person for the Fish and Wildlife Service working on the Puerto Rican parrot. And that was pretty much it for bird study in Puerto Rico at that time. So as a result, I had the opportunity I found during those years 25 species of exotic birds that had never been seen in Puerto Rico. 11, 11 of the finch-like birds were breeding, like the saffron finch and the silver bill I showed you. Here are some others. Three species of parrots that were breeding. Including the pintail wider, the very spectacular bird with the long tail, and so on. And in the Virgin Islands, I uh, went there. I was able to find the lesser Italian bullfinch there breeding. It was an amazing time for ornithology, so it couldn't have been a more fun time to study birds. The thing is, I wasn't really here to study the birds, I was here to help conserve the birds as well. But before I move on to the conservation, I'll make one last point because I ended up doing my PhD here subsequent to that time. And these two birds are very interesting in introduced species because they were brought here during the slave trade. No one knows exactly when, but uh, the bonds mannequin and the Wexville. And it turns out when I later did my PhD work, I started to notice that the bill shapes of these birds seem to be morphing to avoid competition with the native sea eating birds. The same kind of work that you see like the, with the grants and the galapagos seem to be occurring with these invasive birds. The thing is, I, it, was, it would have been a perfect uh, bird to study for future ornithological work. And in fact, Based on that, probably to be the grand bird of all birds is this species. Does anybody know it? The Madagascan Fundia. Why is that a special bird? I won't mention it because this is an ornithological numbers. That bird has been introduced to six different islands during the time of slavery. Which means if there was competition with the native sea eaters, it would have evolved differently on each of those islands. And anybody who ends up studying that bird on those islands is going to have quite a few papers in science. <laughs>
said, that I wasn't here to do that. And I should also mention, besides my work, I mentioned there was someone working on the parrot. The fellow who was working on the parrot at the time discovered a new species of bird, new to, new to science, the ultimate one's wolf. At the same time, there was a herpetologist who discovered the golden goat bee. So the island is still a place where every other year, either a new species of bird was discovered in the science, or some bird, some animal going extinct for 80 or 100 years was rediscovered. So it was an amazing time for discovery, but I wasn't just here to discover, we were here to save birds. And that's what the whole rest of my book is about. It's about saving them. And at that time, there were 13 Puerto Rican parrots left in the whole world, they were all in the wild. Now, of course, the bird is in much better shape. At that time, there were still open, open, open trash cans, open garbage dumps. It was a time of transition to uh, improve sanitation, care, and things like that. And the problems that we have on the island are exact same kind of the problems that are being faced today. Um, there were escape monkeys were a big problem. Now, of course, they have many of the iguanas. The first iguana, loose in Puerto Rico, was found in the 1970s. Now Puerto Rico has probably a million. So the problem with invasive species, the problems of uncontrolled development, all the problems of the 70s are the same problems that we got today. In some cases, they're worse. And so the Caribbean had the same problems Puerto Rico had. That's the Caribbean monk seal that's extinct, came extinct in the 1950s. And the United States had the same problems Puerto Rico and the West Indies had. This is Bachman's Wall, that also became extinct in the 1900s. So the problems are pretty much the same all over the world. And I was a struggling biologist here trying to figure out what to do about it. And here are some of the things that I worked on. I worked on an endangered species list. That's sort of basic. Management plans for protected areas. We can talk all day just about that. We did Mona Island's first management plan, the Eggers Island's first management plan. And I finally wrote the book that I had come here to write. But, but, all of that said, I really wasn't saving anything. I really felt incredibly frustrated that for all the kinds of things that we were doing, we really weren't making much headway. That said, there were things that were happening um, that were improvements. And doing the same thing, that was the beginning of my career. And I realized that you just can't keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. So one of the great things Einstein said besides his theory of relativity was this, and that's what insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different And now, honestly, 50 years later, the conservation world that I see, even though it's improved, its fundamental approach to things has really not changed a lot. And frankly, that explains that the consequence of what we see today around the world in terms of declining species, the problem of climate change, the problem that for every year, even though we have more information on climate change, fewer people believe in it, that just can't stand. And it's partially the professional conservation communities. I wouldn't say it's their fault, but they haven't adapted to addressing the problem properly. So I mentioned that there were some good things already happening. And those good things that just so happen were not in Puerto Rico or the greater Antilles, they're in the lesser Antilles, one of the smaller islands, the island of St. Lucia. And this is the St. Lucia parrot. And in the 1970s, there were only 100 parrots left. St. Lucia parrot. But the fascinating thing, while here in Puerto Rico we, was, we had full time biologists with PhDs working on saving the parrot, we had an aviary, and all those kinds of things, St. Lucia had nothing. They had no money to conserve the bird, except they had that guy that you see in the middle there, and that's Paul Butler. Paul Butler. He was just a young kid college student that went to St. Lucia, but he happened to be interested in social marketing. And he said, you know what? We need to sell the parrots at St. Lucians. How do we do that? Well, for one thing, the St. Lucians didn't know that their parrot was only found in St. Lucia. So he, this is a later picture, 
Uh, but early on, he would be the guy that dressed as a parrot and let that boy his young sign. And he would go from school to school, drift as a parrot, talk to the kids. They went to every single elementary school in the entire island of St. Lucia until they got to the point where every child on the island knew that that parrot was their parrot. And it being their parrot, being versus being any parrot, developed pride, and pride is a value. They ultimately created a bus. Oops. They ultimately created a bus with a uh, parrots and, and nat natural history uh, painted all over it. They had all these different kinds of campaigns. It's a long story. And in fact, the pride campaigns are still run all over the world. Not by a large conservation group, but certainly a growing one, but not nearly in a number of numbers. So that was one of the great things that was happening in the Caribbean. Uh, so the social marketing built around our order, the parrot was a spokesperson, they had almost no funding, they involved every school and restored the birds. Now there are, I think, close to 2,000 solution parrots. So that was a program that really worked. Another thing, another program that was created in uh, Western Antilles were radio and soap operas. People love soap operas, but most of them aren't focused on the environment. But the first environmental radio soap operas were done in the Caribbean in the, in the Western Antilles, built around Palalu, which is a local soup, and also became a very popular way of communicating environmental value. More recently, and this is recent time, Lisa Sorensen, um, before becoming executive director, one of the things she worked on was that book that you see. Oops. That book on the, on the left uh, is a book for teachers on integrating conservation of the Western Muslim Dove and wetlands into elementary school curriculum. So that's a much more recent version of the kinds of things I'm going to talk about. The photo on the right is to do with Caribbean Endemic Bird Day, another campaign to develop pride in local people. I don't know how many surveys or whether surveys have ever been done, and this is a fundamental point, and here's when we start seeing something that's amazing and critical, we're just not addressing well enough. We spend a lot of time talking about surveying shorebirds or surveying seabirds. How many surveys have been done to determine how well the endemic birds of the Caribbean are known? Hopefully it has been done. If it hasn't, it should be absolutely must be done. Because if people don't know they have all these endemic birds, how in the world are they going to save them? So I was fortunate enough after working in Puerto Rico to, as Lisa mentioned, I subsequently began to work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, first in their Latin American program, and subsequently their global program. So I had an amazing opportunity to work with wildlife conservation all over the world. And all through that time, I was always scratching my head because I was never satisfied that we were doing conservation effectively enough. And it was a long time. We had a program in India, um, which again, we spent a lot of time talking about. And that's where, and I was reluctant to even go. It's a long trip to India. I'm not, I don't love flying great distances, and that's been a long trip. When I finally went, I finally started to realize what conservation was all about. And that's where all the answers were. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about India because it's so extraordinary. And why India? There are almost about 200 countries in the world. Well, number one, the comparisons of conservation effort in India to the United States are absolutely dramatic. Number two, we love to, we in the United States love to find excuses to make our work the best. And I would spend a lot of time on that. We always think our conservation efforts are the best, or this is the best, or that is the best. You know what? It's not. And it's very fun to go find, it would be very difficult to find excuses for why our conservation efforts are better than Indians. Now, and that's again, that's what we're going to take a look at. 
What is our normal perception of India? Well, if you look at the papers, the air pollution was and still is in some places unbelievable. If you want to see a purple sky, go to New Delhi. Water pollution, terrible. It's really just sad. Uh, is, and cities figure, okay, well, if the environment is that absolutely terrible in Puerto Rico, how in the world could conserving wildlife be any better? Well, we're going to see. So before we delve a little more into it, just some basic, basic background. Most of India is Hindu. The Hindu religion believes that all living things have a soul. All living things have a soul. So that has big implications. No species has a right to interfere with the rights of another species. That has big implications. They actually believe in rebirth as an animal. So if you step on an ant, you might be stepping on an ant system. So they don't only really respect wildlife, but they have reverence for wildlife. Here's one you're all familiar with, the great oak. So let's look at the extinct birds of North America to begin with. We, of course, have the great oak. Here's a list. These nine species, well, now there's a new paper of mine from the woodpecker, and they still be around, but so there are eight or nine species that have become extinct in North America. Starting with the great oak, I'm going to go through these very quickly. It was quite widespread in the North Atlantic, which it was wiped out, it was heavily harvested. Food, feathers, bait, uh, it's a well-known story. Pastage pigeon, perhaps the most widespread bird in the world, numbering perhaps the billions. It was slaughtered by the train load, it became extinct in the early 1900s. The heath hen, subspecies of the greater prairie chicken, covered a decent chunk of eastern North America, it was also heavily killed for food, extinct on North East India in the 1930s. Estimo curly, same story. A very commonly hunted shorebird. Uh, records, pretty much the East records up into the late 1900s. Carolina parrot, um, bird that was widespread throughout you know, the entire eastern United States, less, uh, also became extinct in the early 1900s. So those five, those five birds were up to nine eight or nine extinct species in the United States were incredibly over harvested. Sometimes the food, in the case of parakeet, it was a nuisance to farmers. So then what about it? Let's compare that to India's extinct birds. Now, looking at, comparing the U.S. to India, we have eight or nine extinct birds in the United States in our 400 year history. So that's pretty much two birds per century becoming extinct. Now, India, India's been around for 5,000 years. So if we have eight or nine birds, two birds per century, and India's been around for 5,000, we should have about 100 extinct birds. So can anybody give us a start to a list of India's extinct birds for all the ornithologists here? So here are the big predators of North America. 
Here, the big predator is India. So it's quite an interesting place to compare. In fact, you'll see the great wolf is in both countries. So that should be particularly fascinating. So I'm going to go through the North American critters because you, this is, these are stories you all know. The great wolf, of course, you know, was wiped out in the war of 48 states. It was extirpated by the 1930s. There were bounties that were slaughtered. They were reintroduced in the 1990s. And now they're doing pretty, they're doing well in protected areas as soon as they leave, they were slaughtered. And of course, there was a big fight so that the states could take control of the wolf killing wolves. And in 2021, Montana expanded hunting to use bait, traps, and snares to strangle wolves. Red wolf. Not a well known wolf, it's a wolf from the southeast. They were all taken into captivity. They were really tried to be established in the southeast and been unsuccessful. They're all of 20 red wolves surviving in the wild in the United States. Grizzly bear, thank goodness, has done a lot better. 90% of its range, it's gone from 90% of its range. Uh, there are from 1,200 to 1,400 grizzly bears in the United States. And the, finally, the mountain lion is the only one that's had any success whatsoever, if you want to call it success. It's a cat that is so incredibly adaptable, it's found from here to the Sierra of Fuego in South America. So it occurs in absolutely every habitat you could possibly want. And so it's done extremely especially well for all the predators, there are about 30,000 left. So that's the story for North American predators. How about India? Well, the tiger. So there's an app of the range of the tiger. It occurs in quite a few countries, but in fact, by far the most remaining tigers in the world are found in India today. And um, we can talk all day. I spent a lot of time in the last part of my career working on tigers. And to be perfectly honest, probably the greatest threat to tigers are the people trying to conserve them. Again, that sounds like a very harsh statement, but I can justify it all day, all day long. So tigers have been eliminated from most of the countries they occurred in. Three fourths of the world's surviving tigers are in India. That's about 3,000 animals. But India, 4 million people live in the reserves of India. Their reserves are nothing like North American reserves. Many tigers leave the reserves. So, in those years, the early 1800s, early 1900s, 30,000 people died from tigers. Now, in this country, forget about wolves, coyotes. We don't like coyotes. I mean, there's one documented coyote killed in the United States in the past 70 years, and we're upset about coyotes. Look at what happened to the tiger. Recently, 2019, 95 people killed by tigers in India. Now here, if you want one number to leave with, I'm going to give you three or four key facts that you need to walk out of here with, and this is one of them. In 1920, India had 100,000 tigers, when its population was the same size as that of the United States. And a smaller country, one third the size of the United States. So that decline from 1920s to today, from 100,000 animals to 3,000 animals, what's that due to? It's almost entirely due to demand for tigers outside of India. This is not Indians killing tigers. These are tigers being killed for export to China and other places. Unlike all that devastation that we saw of North American predators strictly because of North American attitudes. Leopards. Leopards are not friendly. They're about the size of a mountain lion, except they're 10 times or 100 times more dangerous. They were notorious for killing livestock and for people. One single leopard killed 95 people between the years 1918 and 26. There are 13,000 tigers, uh, leopards rather, in any 
And again, why are they, why are they declined? Strictly because of outside influences, not because of presenting white unions. And that's absolutely a fundamental point. The lion, so this is other species of lion, lion used to occur throughout Asia. You can see its range. It's gone from every single country in Asia, except for India. Now, there aren't very many left, but one thing I didn't mention, I'll have a note to it soon, is that India was occupied, was colonized for 400 years. That's the entire length of the history of the United States. 300 years by the Mughals, 150 years by the British. The British loved to shoot stuff. So as you see from that note, 300 killed by one British officer. And even so, tiger lions survive there, and in fact, they're starting to increase in numbers. Cheetahs were loved to death in India. They weren't slaughtered to death, they were loved to death. So they're no longer there, but they succumbed again because of the British and local rule. One local emperor had 9,000 cheetahs during his lifetime. So that's the story of the predators in India, and they're starting to reestablish it. So no indication can be expected, again, no negative influence by the population of India. Now here's it. I mentioned the great wolf occurring both in the United States and India. There are two to three thousand gray wolves in India. They have never been exterminated. Fascinatingly, it's a much more dangerous animal in India than it is here. Between 1993 and 1995, 60 children were killed by gray wolves. I don't think we have a record for over 100 years of a wolf killing a human in North America. And are they persecuted? No. Look how different that wolf is. All right, what about the largest herbivore? largest herbivore in North America. The bison, American bison, you won't know, there were probably 40 million American bison. Um, by 1900, there were practically none, and now they've been restored. There are about 30,000 today, except if you go to the National Park, you won't see the most bison anywhere. When they leave the park, is every effort possible by the states to shoot them. And as far as the threatening, it was interesting because in the news just recently, a bison killed a tourist in the park and it was all over the newspaper because it's so rare for the bison to have an impact on tourists or people. Unlike the biggest herbivore in India, which is the Asian elephant. The Asian elephant is quite a huge threat to people. From the reserves where it occurs, it can smell food for up to 20 miles away, and so they wander outside the parks care of every, all the small rural farmers, small little plots on which they depend, and it caused huge damage, 400 human deaths per year, and still with 30,000 elephants in the wild in India. And what's the threat to the Asian elephant? It's not Indians. It's again, taking their tusks and selling them in the world. What does Indian damage look like? American bison don't do this. That's your rural house. So what's a day called lesson? I beat this very strongly because it's so important. Indian's wildlife is far more dangerous. Predators are far more dangerous, as is its largest herbivore, than anything we have in the United States. They survive much more successfully. Um, minimal persecution by the Indians because they have a, will tolerate the conflict. And that's been for 5,000 years. So what does this teach us about conservation? So let's look at some of the things that we all take for granted. We all don't take for granted. We all know. We all know that these are the things that matter when it comes to conservation. Money. You can't serve anything without 
money. Great American fallacy. Space. Population summits. There aren't any people there, you don't have to worry about it. So we're going to quickly run through these nine different values that the conservation community, not only in the United States, but all over the world, thinks are the driving forces. These are the driving forces for what conservation, what is needed for conservation. If you don't do all of them, you're never going to conserve wildlife. Money, as I said, it's a big balance. Who has more money, the United States or India? I can't imagine. I don't have the numbers, but we don't have to go into that. Space. There's India superimposed on the lower 48 states. All told, India is about one quarter the size of the United States, if you include Alaska. So it's a much smaller place. What about population size? If you don't have many people, you don't have, you have less conflict with wildlife. India has four times the population of the United States. Obviously, the less time you've occupied an area, the less potential there is for conflict with its wildlife. We've occupied the United States for 400 years, and it has been occupied by advanced civilization for 5,000 years, including 400 years of colonization. Habitat availability. With fewer people, you have more open space, it's easier to set aside habitat for wildlife. And one of our great measures of conservation success is how much habitat we've set aside. So the more space you have to set aside habitat, supposedly that's really critical for wildlife conservation. Of course, strong laws with teeth. When I was coming up in conservation, a law without teeth was a law not worth passing. So if you didn't have teeth that made people do what you wanted them to do, you couldn't conserve anything. Total fallacy. Law enforcement. What good is a law if you don't enforce it? Advantage of all of these important fundamental truths of U.S. conservation are all favorable to the United States. India does not compare to the United States in any of them. Scientific capacity. Environmental scientists in the United States, 80,000. I couldn't find a number for India. There's no comparison. And when I used to hire staff, and I had a lot of food, asked them the question, you know what? What do you think needs to be done? You're in some country where there's no concern for wildlife. What do you think is the most important thing to do? And in various ways, we have to find out what's there, we have to count it, we have to catalog it. I was just talking to a friend of mine who worked in Paraguay, who had a form of the Paraguayan Natural History Museum. Smithsonian went down there in the, in the or 80s. That's exactly what they did. They started collecting everything they could in Panama in Paraguay to document what was there because you can't say that we documented it. A myth. Cultural values. This is the ninth item on our list. I'll repeat here the beliefs. I'm reading them. The fundamental beliefs of India fundamental beliefs of India towards wildlife arguably would favor them. They have a set of values that favor wildlife. So, let's take one interesting example. Insects. Why do we think about insects in the United States? There's our answer. What do Indians think about insects? That's their answer. So that thing there in that photograph is called the Kolam. That's a segment, that's another key take on this, that thing there. So that thing is a drawing made on the street that's only intended to last a day. As pretty as the design is, it's intricate and as much work as it took, it's there to last a day. Because why? Why was the Kolam made of? Originally, Kolam was made out of rice powder. Why would you make a design out of rice powder? Well, they make that design to attract insects. Who in the world wants to attract insects? Indians do 
people is they respect them. And they want to remind themselves about how important insights are to nature. And then koalas can be very simple, they can be very intricate, but they're not done by a bunch of rich people who have nothing to do with their time. It's a reminder of how humans and life on Earth are integrated. So, we looked at nine factors. Eight of them are clearly to the advantage of the United States, things that we all think are absolutely fundamental to effective conservation. And one, which we talk about but don't know how to do, and that is address cultural values. And I can tell you, so we learn how to address cultural values, we won't conserve anything. So we looked at the bird life, we looked at the predators, we looked at the large body of herbivore, and as I said, these other things don't matter, to the point where cultural values trump every other value in the book. It sounds shocking, I don't believe it, except what I'm showing you here is something I retired eight years ago. I only wish I'd thought more about this when I was working and spending tens of millions of dollars concerning wildlife, because this is simply not what we believe. It's not widely recognized. And so we have never, never really figured out how to address cultural values properly. And until we spoke to focus much more effort on it, it is simply not going to happen. So given this new knowledge, we're going to look at conservation from one other perspective, and then we'll get down to some solutions. So what if, when the Mayflower came over in 1620, there were no Hindus on it? So what if, it, I'm sorry, no pilgrims, there would be Hindus. What if there were no pilgrims in there? More than half the birds extinct in North America would almost certainly still be here. Past the indigenous that were wiped out by overhunting and slaughter, um, the great hawks, those are the species that would almost certainly still be here because they would not have been slaughtered like they were. And as far as the others, that's a whole other discussion. So five of the nine extinct birds would still be with us, regardless of any changes in laws or anything else. Why is it misrecognized? I sort of touched on it before, I don't know if you can read this, but basically we have tremendously anti-Eastern bias. And I mentioned down there below, I don't know what it says, the development of principles and practices of wildlife research and management, Asian and American approaches. What is that? That's a book. It's a 500 page tome. It's a 500 page tome that was written by about 15 American scientists that were the top of the line conservation professionals in the United States and 10 Indian scientists that were top of the line Indian professionals um, in the 1990s, I think this was written. So it's this big work comparing, uh, comparing conservation in the United States and conservation in India how they collaborate and how they work together to create effective conservation. So, isn't that the perfect place to talk about exactly what we're talking about here? How many chapters are covering the societal values of India and how we take U.S. technology and apply it to India, and how we take Indian technology and apply it to the United States? And bingo, we are home and free. Well, there are no chapters dedicated to the culture of Indian in that book. There isn't a paragraph dedicated to the cultural values of Indian in that book. There is one sentence. One sentence. And that, as I remember, included 10 Indians writing it. So it's partially our bias to India, but it's also partially the bias of Indians towards Western 
there's, as I said, the needle's column on. There's a colonization mindset that we don't see because it's so pervasive. Indians, most of Indians, best scientists, are all coming to the States to study. There's great prestige to come to the States and get a PhD. And what do they learn? All the U.S. principles for conservation, and they think they back to India. And what do you think they're doing? They're destroying the culture of India. That's safe as far, right? Because they want to westernize it. So there's a tremendous anti-Asian bias. There's this neo-colonial, frankly, a very neo-colonial approach to conservation. And there's this residual mindset of colonialism that is very hard to write out. And I can give you other examples, but this book is the perfect example. And that, frankly, was produced by my office. <laughs> so these are the basic reasons why um, this fundamental point of the importance of values is not well recognized. And of course, social value is very difficult to quantify. It's incredibly easy to count animals. It's incredibly difficult to figure out how you've changed the slide of values. Not only that, when you start reading all the journals about conservation psychology, all you get is how difficult it is to change values and this and that and the other thing. But fundamental point is if you don't change them, then you're back to where Einstein said insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. It's a lot easier to count than it is to change values. So, solutions. What in the world do we do about it? Well, if conservation is about values, then we need to focus on society. If we're going to focus on society, how can we then? Well, in my mind, and I'm going to go through a few of these because they're not have a lot of time, is you look, instead of doing what we spend so much time doing, which is studying different groups of animals, migratory birds, shorebirds, seabirds, beast birds, those birds, we need to focus on the segments of society. We need to divide up society the same way we divide up popular life. And we need to work, we need to develop programs for reaching different segments of society because different segments are reached in different ways. You don't reach an inner city school kid the same way as you reach a cattle rancher out in Wyoming. It's a whole different ballgame. So one size does not fit all. So there are some examples of stakeholders, decision makers, protected area managers, elementary school students. Uh, the list is huge. So let's take an example. We had some funds to invest in Mexico. We had some funds to invest in Mexico. And um, we went down to Mexico and we worked together 50 conservation groups. We did not ask them what were the most endangered species in Mexico. We did not ask them what were the most endangered habitats in Mexico. We asked them what sector of society is influencing conservation the most that you are affecting the least. And they said, decision makers, we can't reach the decision makers. They're impossible. They're just, they're powerful. They don't want anything to do with us. Does this sound familiar? Yes. So all these groups couldn't reach decision makers. So we hired the next decision maker. And we said, hey, how do we reach your peers? It took two years, two years to figure out how in the world to reach these peers. And you know what we decided? We decided. They decided the only way you're going to reach them is to isolate them. Make them happy and isolate them. How in the hell can you make them happy and isolate them? You put them on a boat. You put them out on a boat, you take them to a nice place, you have to see if Cortez in light blue in that picture, and they can't get off the boat. <laughs> you take them out for five days, and they're stuck. So it took a long time to come up with that. And it was like, this is a genius. This is a genius, except we hadn't thought of it before. So that brings us to solution two. We focused on a, on a certain sector of society, and then we built an initiative specifically to reach that sector. So this is exposure. Well, what do you know? The president of Mexico heard about this poetry. It hadn't happened yet. 
We're in the process of selecting legislators to go on the trip and the you know, counterparts of Mexico. And the president of Mexico called in our organizer and said, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're going to take this boat trip around and see if Cortez can explain environmental issues to a bunch of legislators. The next evening, the president said, where are you going? Where are you? Where? And they said, well, one of the places we're going is Cabo Bulbo. So there's on the left is Cabo Bulbo. And at Cabo Bulbo, there was a plan to build a huge industrial complex. And the president said, yes, it is the permit approved for that, the federal permit for building this complex. And they said, well, we're suggesting it happens to have been approved. Well, within Two months, the president two more, had two more assessments done, and then permit was canceled. So here was a giant complex that had that been done, been reviewed by the normal process, could not wasn't stuff that was approved. But when you focus on the right segment of society to make a change, this huge project was stopped in its tracks. If we took in that same meeting, we not only identified decision makers, we identified protected areas managers, which led to the most amazing changes. I don't have enough time to go into it, but amazing changes. Next, we had 600 protected areas. We agreed that they would train all future professional protected areas managers to go through a training course. When they created the training course, Mexico was so in love with the course, they made every existing manager about a thousand managers take the course electronically so that they can get the training that was we had hoped and only would be provided to future protected area managers. So these things can be done, they have to be done if you focus properly on what it what what the fundamental needs of conservation are all about. So we were hoping for a nine-month course for future protected area managers. We created a 13-month course for every protected area manager now and in the future. So there are other solutions. I don't have time to go into them. Um, the identifying of community conservation values, if you don't know what they are, we say it about animals. If you don't know what animals occur here, how can you save them? No, that isn't it. It's if you don't know what the values of the society is, you can't save them. You can't save them because you don't know what people believe. You have to know what people believe help build those values towards wildlife and humanity and safety. We have to strive for shared values. And in fact, conservation is much more like a religion than it is a science, because it's how people view the world. They need to be put into some kind of charter so people recognize them, so the communities can embrace them. So there are quite a few steps that need to happen. Democracy and conservation in this country, this country, 4% of the populace are less hunters. They probably control 80% of the funding. This is the number I made up. I'd love for somebody to substantiate it. They control conservation from the top to the bottom of this country. When you have a democratic system for conserving wildlife, you have a lot of trouble saving anything. We're very technology heavy. We're not enough into the social sciences. Skip this. So, number of acres, number of acres protected, that's not a measure of conservation. A measure of conservation is what sacrifice are people going to make to have wildlife around them. No sacrifice, no wildlife. India is all about sacrifice. The United States is all about convenience. So bird conservation and all conservation, including climate change and all the issues that face us in the conservation world, needs a major, major transformation in the United States. It needs a new path forward, and it's time that we take. We want more comprehensive solutions, you'll have to read that book there. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>